Global Warming, It's Not Just Hot Air, with Elizabeth Rush, author of The 21. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Uh, this week, we're going to look at global warming. It's not just hot air. We're going to be talking with Elizabeth Rush, author of The 21. Uh, climate change, the ultimate uninvited guest, has been making itself quite comfortable lately. It's like that distant cousin who shows up unannounced, cranks up the heat, and then leaves the door wide open. Cousin! You! Cousin! Where are you? I took the heat up! The science behind global warming is as fascinating as it is concerning. Now, if you, now, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been burning fossil fuels like a barbecue at a Texas tailgate party, releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Our sunlight reaching Earth from our local stellar furnace, the sun, comes in a wide range of wavelengths, striking everything from oceans and forests to the caps of Istanbul. Uh, these objects, including the cats, tend to release this energy in the form of infrared waves which are then absorbed by carbon dioxide like a lobster entering a trap. Free the lobsters! This warming is causing our ice caps to melt at concerning rates, leading to rising sea levels as well as a loss of habitat for animals of the Arctic and Antarctic. You know what? In, in fact, I think I think P-SPAN is showing some coverage from the floor of the Congress right now. Ladies and gentlemen and all good penguins, I stand before the U.S. Congress today not just as a penguin, but as a concerned citizen of the planet. You see, my home in Antarctica is melting faster than your resolve to stick to your New Year's resolutions. Now, I don't want to ruffle any feathers here, but we've got to talk about this thing called climate change. It's like you've turned the whole planet into a sauna and forgot to tell us penguins to bring our swim trunks. And here I am, I showed up in my tuxedo. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's no fun doing a backstroke in the ocean because your iceberg turned into an ice Kill. Yeah, yeah. So, here's my proposal. Let's turn down the heat. Maybe you can take public transportation sometime, or waddle to work instead of driving cars. And maybe eat less of my friend Charlie, the cow. She's, she's really nice if you get to know her. Remember, it's not just about saving us penguins. It's about saving this wonderful party we call life on Earth. So, let's chill out on the carbon emissions a bit, shall we? I strongly urge the U.S. Congress to pass the Penguin Act. Preserving Earth's natural greenery, upgrading our investment in nature, Penguin passes Congress. Penguins rejoice. Global climate change is also causing more intense storms and rainfalls in some areas, while other areas are left as dry as the humor on this show. It is also vital to remember that not only humans, but plants and animals are also affected by global climate change. Alterations to flowering and blooming cycles combined with changing migrations could have severe repercussions for life worldwide. If a group of migrating animals normally passes through an area where their favorite food normally grows, and the fruits, they find the fruits have long passed, this can have an adverse effect on both species. The Cosmic Companion is now producing our first feature-length film, Gaia Rising. 
This future history of climate change in the 21st century tells the story of three disparate individuals brought together by the challenges of a world in turmoil from environmental devastation. Coming up is our first trailer from that film. Afterwards, we're going to be talking with Elizabeth Rush, author of B21, the story of a group of young people using the legal systems to secure rights to a clean environment for all. In a world on the brink of environmental catastrophe, Gaia Rising presents a gripping tale of resilience, redemption, and the urgent fight against climate change in the late 21st century, as three lives intertwine, shaping the fate of humanity. Meet Ana Luisa, a driven advertising executive in bustling New York City. As flooding threatens to engulf her beloved home, she makes a bold decision to leave her family's business and confront the harsh reality of climate change. Embarking on a new life in Tucson, Ana Luisa's journey will lead her to unexpected connections, forever changing the course of her life. And in Kenya, Wathaika, a determined farmer, battles against a devastating drought that plunges his family into poverty. Fueled by an unyielding spirit, he gathers a group of like-minded activists who combat the drought's impact on their village. However, when illness strikes his loved ones and desperation looms, Wadi's struggle takes an extraordinary turn, attracting attention from across the world and forging an unexpected alliance that could prove to be their ultimate salvation. Meanwhile, in Wyoming, Bill Sawyer, a climate change denier, finds his beliefs crumbling under the weight of an escalating climate crisis. As unprecedented hailstorms ravage his community, Bill begins to accept truths he once vehemently denied. As he grapples with the consequences of his beliefs, Bill is confronted with a chance at redemption, aligning his fate with the two other protagonists on a path to meaningful change. As these three disparate lives converge, Gaia Rising unveils a powerful narrative of hope, determination, and human connection against the backdrop of a world in turmoil. United by a shared purpose, they embark on a transformative mission to shift global perspectives on climate change harnessing the potential of cutting-edge technology, including artificial intelligence and quantum computing, to heal the wounded planet. But their journey is far from easy. Confronted by opposition and powerful forces determined to maintain the status quo, the stakes soar higher, and the battle to save Earth becomes more intense and heart-wrenching. With breathtaking landscapes, heart-stopping moments, and an evocative soundtrack, this film urges us to reflect on our responsibility to safeguard our planet and inspires us to join the global movement for a sustainable future. Living in the face of adversity and despair, Gaia Rising shows us that the strength of the human spirit and the echoes of our actions can ripple across time, creating a world where hope can flourish even amidst the darkest of challenges. Gaia Rising, coming in 2024 from the Cosmic Companion. Visit GaiaRisingFilm.com. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Elizabeth Rush. She is the author of now two dozen books for children and adults, and her new book, The 21, is now the number one new release for teens and young adults in politics and government. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Great. Now, uh, the story tells the story of 21 young people who argue that the government has knowingly violated kids' constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property uh, by encouraging and permitting the fossil fuel energy system. And the book is a fascinating look behind the scenes of an ongoing case arguing that the U.S. government knowingly violated these rights by by permitting the energy uh, the fossil fuel energy system. Can you share some of the backstory of this and how the book came to be? 
You bet. So um, the 21 is based on the ongoing federal court case, Juliana versus the United States. Um, I started to track it. It was filed in 2015. And in 2016, my youngest child was in middle school at the environmental uh, middle school here in Portland. And she and classmates and some teachers took a road trip down to Eugene, Oregon, for one of the very first hearings uh, of the case. So um, I heard about it through her and my first reaction was, oh, this is great. I'm so glad that young people, you know, have another way to have their voices heard about climate change. But because of her interest, I, you know, dug in deeper. I started reading some of the media coverage, reading the briefs and looking at um, videos of the various hearings. And um, my thinking about the change really, uh, about the case really changed to, wow, these 21 young people actually have quite a, a strong case and that if they win, it could um, be a huge step forward um, on climate change. So, um, you know, the book is really, it's kind of like a legal thriller. Um, it's the case has been going on for eight years, um, and I think about it as almost like the Aaron Brockovich of climate change. So mm -hmm. I um, tell the stories of Julia Olson, who is the young small town environmental lawyer who started the case. I interviewed five of the plaintiffs in depth about, you know, the climate impacts that have, have injured them, about why they got involved with the case, what their parents thought. You know what it was like to fly to Eugene, Oregon for the first hearing. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, the youngest plaintiff, his name is Levi Dreheim, and he was eight years old when the case was filed. Um, he lived on a barrier island in Florida, and when he, um, you know, was about seven years old, he saw a map that showed that his home would be underwater from sea level rise in his lifetime. He has also had to evacuate twice from his home um, from kind of giant hurricanes that were stirred up by climate change. And he has nightmares about, you know, wandering around his neighborhood, which is damaged and not, be, not being able to find his parents and, you know, wondering if if he's ever going to be able to go home again. So, um, you know, I interviewed Levi about, you know, how he got involved. He's He's a great character. He he's like the little the little brother, the little sibling in the case. Right. He's um the all the kids are older and they're he's constantly leaping into their arms and he's tossing them on, you know, they're tossing them onto their shoulders. Um, um, but he's also really passionate about climate change and has been an incredible spokesperson for the case as well. Wow. Wow. And uh, so how did these 21 young people come together? Yeah, so um, Julia Olson, who um, started the nonprofit Our Children's Trust, um, she had this idea that rather than kind of she she's an environmental lawyer and she'd been doing all these um, lawsuits, like you know, to sort of block these damaging environmental projects, and so she was winning a lot of the cases, but it was like whack a mole, like she'd win somewhere and then another project would pop up. So she thought, you know, we need to do something bigger and something that is going to take on this problem all at once. And so she looked to a powerful document, the U.S. Constitution. The Fifth Amendment says that we have a right to life, liberty, and property. And the case basically asked the question, you know, how can we have life, liberty, and property if we can't breathe because of thick smoke from wildfires, if our homes are being devastated from um, dangerous hurricanes, heat waves, droughts, and wildfires. So she started, she also thought that young people are the most vulnerable to these climate impacts. Right. And they also are going to live a lot longer than us adults and have to deal with these climate impacts that are only just going to get worse and worse. So she started by reaching out to some young people in her town. Um, and they were, you know, young climate activists who are already doing things like setting up recycling in school and, you know, planting trees and those kinds of things. And they reached out to other young people. She wanted to have 10 plaintiffs, but she got such an overwhelming response. She drew the line at 21. Um, 
So, you know, she reached out to these young people, talked to them, talked to their parents. The families had conversations about what does it mean to sue the federal government? You know, how long is this case going to take? Um, and it has become, you know, much a much bigger part of their lives than I think that any of them ever imagined. But they're also really buoyed by working together to do something to save our planet. Hmm. And where is the case at now? Where what's what's happening in it? Yeah. So as I said, uh, the case has been going on for eight years and it's still ongoing. Um, it uh, there was a an early ruling from the district court that was in the kids' favor, basically suggesting that they have a right to a trial um, on whether or not they have a constitutional right to a stable climate. That was appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals several times. Um, it's been up to the U.S. Supreme Court twice, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled twice in the kids' favor. They were all there in Eugene, Oregon, set for trial in October of 2018 when there was a pre-trial motion and the rug got pulled out from underneath them. The most recent development is that um, there was a hearing two years ago. Um, the, the legal team was basically saying they were going to change the original complaint only to focus on declaratory relief. So that means all they wanted to happen is that the, the court would rule that the kids have a constitutional right to a stable climate and that the government's actions in allowing mining and drilling on federal public lands, permitting pipelines and subsidizing fossil fuels, that all that behavior was unconstitutional. But they weren't asking for a whole plan to fix it. They just wanted it to be ruled unconstitutional. Well, this summer in June, um, the district court ruled in the kids' favor, and they are now on back uh, on back on track to trial, um, which is not scheduled yet, but could happen as early as um, early next year. Hmm. And um, another case, of course, where young people have recently had a victory is Held versus Montana. Can you talk a little bit about that case and how it might be different or could relate to to the current case. Yeah, so um, the federal case, Juliana versus United States, as I said, was brought by um, Julia Olson and Our Children's Trust. Our Children's Trust also supports the youth in the Montana case. Um, so while Juliana, the federal case, has 21 young people, the Montana case was 16 young people, that they're all from the state of Montana. Mm. The legal approach is very similar. So it's the young people saying that they have been injured by climate change, that government has contributed to those injuries, and that they need to stop the behavior that contributes to those injuries. Um, so when the federal case was filed around the same time, Julia Olson and her colleagues filed lawsuits in all 50 states. Held v. Montana is a result of one of those filings. That tri that case actually was the very first um, kid-led constitutional right climate case to go to trial. It went to trial in Helena, Montana in June of this year. Um, one of the differences is that instead of looking at the U.S. Constitution, that case points to the Montana Constitution, which says specifically that citizens have a right to a safe and healthy environment. So the amazing thing is that they went to trial, they presented their evidence, they testified, the experts testified, and um, the judge recently ruled in the kids' favor that they have a constitutional right to a stable climate, that Montana has to take into account greenhouse gases and climate impacts when um, issuing permits for fossil fuel development. So hugely revolutionary, a giant, um, a giant win. And while these are at different court levels, right, state court and federal court, they're different, they're different court systems. Um, you know, the judges read across these different court systems and a ruling like this, you know, can give a court judicial courage um, to to establish uh, climate change as a constitutional right. So um, that that ruling could have an impact on Juliana. Um, there's also a case going to trial in Hawaii. Um, kids there are suing the state of Hawaii based on that state um, constitution. Two of those plaintiffs are from West Maui, um, which is where Lahaina burned to the ground. 2,000 houses burned to the ground, close to 1,000 lives lost. 
right? So that's going to be testimony in that trial. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of these cases of young people testifying about how climate um, change is impacting them, about how the government is actually actively contributing to climate change, and that they have a right um, for this behavior to stop. And um, and um, that that's the, a, a first and huge step toward actually addressing the climate crisis. Hmm. And it seems, you know, of course, the first person that might come to mind when you think of young people in the climate is Greta Thunberg. Um, how, do, how does she and the Parkland students and the 21 help inspire young people to to make a difference in helping the environment. Yeah, well, interestingly, the 21 began their work several years before Greta Thunberg's first climate strike. So their case was filed in 2015. Greta's was uh, first strike was in 2018. But the 21, by now, they know and work with Greta Thunberg. So they have also led climate strikes. They have worked, uh, you know, they, with Greta, have lobbied the U.S. Congress. They speak out through the media. I think what's important here is that, you know, young people are already doing amazing work, marching in the streets, talking to the representatives, talking to the media. But what the 21 does is it highlights another really powerful way that young people are speaking up, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, kids don't have the vote. So they have no voice through our legislature, legislative branch and our executive branch. So they are turning to the courts to protect their rights. And um, and that's turning out to be quite a powerful way of having not just their voices heard, but actually possibly their rights protected. Mm -hmm. And, but, and uh, so what about, I mean, I can imagine, and there's so many things wrong, even when I was a kid, you know, I remember, you know, and it just felt um, disempowering. It felt like, especially as a kid, you couldn't do anything against these, or a young adult, you just couldn't do anything against these monolithic uh, industries that seem to have a chokehold on everything. And I think it can be, it can be disheartening. How does, how does, how can individual young people who may not have connections or um really make a difference yeah well i think one of the things that i learned by talking with these young people is that you know in their communities around the country they had already been starting to work on things like you know recycling in their school you know levi was planting grass on the dunes to help uh, protect the dunes from sea level rise and erosion um and and all of them when i asked that question you know how do you how do you stay hopeful? How do you continue this work and, and in fact take on more? You know, they say it's really um, coming together with young, other young people who share the same concerns and the same desire to do something. That it's when the 21 are all together, you know, for a hearing and where they can share their challenges, what what they've dealt with you know, the, the the blowback that they've gotten. I mean, you know, Jaden in Louisiana, Nathan Baring in um, in Fairbanks, Alaska, you know, those are places that are very, um, a lot of people, um, you know, earn their jobs and their living from the fossil fuel industry. So there's a lot of um, criticism happening around them all the time. So it's really turning to other people who are trying, other young people who are trying to make a difference that has really buoyed these young people to continue their work, both locally and in this lawsuit. And I think that that is a, a message for young people everywhere. Find your people, work with them. That's, that's I think that may be good advice at any age. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. Right. Uh, so, as far as this case is concerned, what, how could some, how could the outcome of it really have? What sort of long-term implications could the outcome of this case have on environmental laws? Yeah, so I really believe that this case um, could be the Brown versus Board of Education of climate change. So Brown versus Brown versus Board of Education ended segregation in school. So basically, once the court said that segregation was unconstitutional, 
segregation, you know, had to stop. That was the first step along mm -hmm. that journey. Likewise, I think once courts say that government support of fossil fuels is unconstitutional, that behavior must stop. And that means no more permitting of fossil fuel developments on public lands. So currently 25% of U.S. emissions come from fossil fuels extracted from federal public lands. So it's our own lands that are where that extraction is happening. So if they win, that has to stop. That is going to have on its own will have a huge impact. But honestly, I think that it's also more um, part of a of a broader movement, uh, both within this country and um, you know federally and also in the states that these cases are going to be happening. There are also cases across the globe that are really reframing climate change as um, as a constitutional issue or a human rights issue that 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 a stable climate is a human right. In fact, I just saw on the news this morning that um, there's a hearing today in the European Court of Human Rights. Six Portuguese youth um, are um, up against 32 European countries, and they're basically wow. arguing that, um, that, that a stable climate is a human right and that those countries are not doing enough to protect their human rights. So this, this legal approach is, is not going away. I think it's just getting started, and I think that um, the legal tide is shifting on climate change and that courts are our last and best hope on climate and that young people are leading the way and they're winning. And I think they're going to continue winning. That's, that's wonderful. Finally, what, what can this all teach us, teach us and especially youth about empowerment? Well, I think that the 21 are such a ray of light, you know, in this dark time, their stories and their work are so inspiring. You know, I, I feel like people always say, like, kids are our future. But what the 21 says is the future is now. And these kids are making, you know, major change right now. And we should be watching and listening and cheering them on. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the book, Elizabeth, and it was fabulous talking with you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate your interest. Yeah, that was Elizabeth Rush, author of The 21. Check it out wherever you get your awesome books. Addressing climate change requires us to turn this ship around faster than a squirrel on espresso. And that's fast. Switching from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources like wind and solar power is like swapping out an old gas guzzling car for a shiny new electric one that hums along quieter than a mime at a library. Shh. But mitigation isn't enough. We also need to adapt both for humanity and for other life. This could involve building seawalls, protecting coastal communities from rising sea levels, combined with the development of new smart cities in areas less subject to the effects of climate change. Many of these could be built on oceans, an idea called sea steading. A myriad of these new communities on the oceans and in space might give rise to thousands of new nations, cultures, languages, political systems, schools of art, and mythos. We could also potentially reverse some of the damage done by climate change. Reforestation could help absorb more carbon dioxide, and technologies are being developed to capture and store CO2 or even remove it from the atmosphere. You know, this is kind of like giving Mother Nature a spa day. Here you go, Ma. Have a nice carbon scrub. Reducing carbon emissions is like going on a diet after a holiday feast. First, we need to cut down on the junk food. That's fossil fuels. We can switch to cleaner energy sources like wind and solar power, which are like the fruits and veggies of the energy world. Speaking of fruits and veggies, the production of a vegetarian diet has just over one three hundredth of the carbon footprint of raising the same amount of meat. 
The UN determined that agriculture around the world produces 18% of global greenhouse emissions more than transportation. Moving to a plant-based diet has a significant impact on individual carbon footprints. This is both because of the additional land and resources needed to raise livestock, as well as the fact that cows release methane. Lots of methane. Private automobiles produce half of the carbon dioxide emissions from the U.S. transportation sector. Each gallon of gasoline burned produces 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. Uh, walking, biking, and taking public transportation all greatly reduce the amount of carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. There also exists the possibility of launching large solar sails, shading Earth and cooling the planet while collecting energy from the sun, converting it into clean energy for use in space and on Earth. So yes, climate change is a big challenge, but with innovation, determination, and global cooperation, we can tackle it together head on. After all, who doesn't love a great comeback story? Well, we had fewer points than the other team, but then we scored more points. Then we won the game. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we will be seeing the invisible. We'll welcome Anand Barma from National Geographic to the show, talking about his new work, Invisible Wonders, Photographs of the Hidden World. Make sure to join us starting on the 21st of October, just 10 days before Halloween. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please download, follow, share, subscribe to us on all your favorite social media outlets. Tell your friends about the show. Most of them will keep talking to you. Probably. Clear sky.